Hello and welcome once again to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Substelny, the professor of this class this term. Today we are in almost everybody's favorite week of the term where we will talk about brainstorming and prototyping for creating games. And we're going to do some really great exercises for our labs this week. We will not be writing any computer code this week. We will be having much more fun than that. Uh, let's move along. Okay, previously we said when we talked about Farmville that uh, they were setting out to create simple games that people would like but could easily set aside and that they could be played in a tab of the browser while you're uh, on a conference call at work, say. And they wanted to make the link between virtual goods and the real world social relationships that people had. So they would buy those virtual goods and show them off to their friends. And when I say they, I mean the players of the game. None of these ideas had a single thing to do with farming. The simple uh, game, easily played in a tab in the browser, none of those ideas had anything to do with actual farming. Another thing we previously said in the game, keep talking and nobody explodes for Oculus Rift, uh, was a really cool game that came out uh, last year where um, one person, the, the, the situation was they discovered that typically when an Oculus Rift is around, there's one person who has an Oculus Rift and a lot of people who want to play. And so they wanted to come up with something that uh, they could do. And so they came up with these code books of things that uh, uh, other players could be doing while the player with the Oculus was working. And so as long as people kept looking up information for the person wearing the Oculus, they could uh, disarm bombs and things like that. And it turns out Oculus Rifts attracts an audience. And the question was, could we make it fun for the audience who were looking at the person playing with the o Oculus Rift? And so while one person is wearing it and looking at a certain virtual scene, other players are looking through books, trying to figure out what codes uh, need to be entered, what wires need to be cut, et cetera, to keep the bomb from blowing up everybody. And that turned out to be a really fun game that they stumbled on inadvertently. So where did these ideas for these totally unusual games come from? Well. Csikszentmihalyi described creativity stages. He said uh, there was preparation, becoming immersed in the uh, problem of the game you want. There's incubation, churning the ideas of the game subconsciously. Insight, after the idea churns enough, you have the aha moment. Evaluation, and this is very important. Sometimes that aha turns out to stink, but every now and then you have that awesome aha, like uh, Farmville or Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator, that turns out to be fantastic. And then elaboration, that's the 99% perspiration part. This is where you actually create the idea. All right, today we are going to do exercises in which we brainstorm some games. We're going to get together in teams with uh, items that we will use to brainstorm games, including toys. And those of you at home, get out some toys today, because in lab you're going to need them for your game creation exercise. When we do this brainstorming exercise for game ideas, we should not criticize our teammates. We should not censor our own ideas, no matter how crazy it is. 
let it out, maybe everyone's going to love it. Remember, there are no bad ideas. Even if your idea is, hey, let's ask the, the player to grind for hours and hours to grow melons in their farm. That sounds like a terrible idea, but it turns out to have entertained millions of people for millions of hours. All right, today we will also do some prototyping of games. We're going to actually come up with the flow, the core gameplay, which we're about to discuss, of some game ideas. Let's talk about the types of prototyping discussed in your book, Game Design Workshop. There is the physical prototype. That's the main thing we're going to do today, and it's probably the main thing you've never heard of in your life. Um, you may have heard of the other ones before. In physical prototyping, you use toys, sheets of paper, tables of numbers, dice, things like that. There's the software prototype, which you may have heard of already for creating a game, where you would use a game engine like Game Maker, Alice, Unity, something like that before you started working on the production game. There's also the visual prototype. In a visual prototype, where you might use toys or software or both things, you're not worried about how the game is played, but how the game looks. Here, some toys are being used. Actually, these very biplanes are being used to picture what the view of the game would look like. And photographs are taken and shown to software developers. And the visual prototype helps to understand how things are going to be visually. And physical prototyping is going to be this week's main topic, where, where we will use toys and do that, because this will probably be, for most of you, the first time you do any physical prototyping. Physical prototyping is very useful for things like fighting games, massively multiplayer online role-playing games, real-time strategy games, first-person shooter games, things like that. Physical prototyping is also very useful for developers of race games, chase games, rescue games, exploration games, many of the game types that we discussed earlier. But physical prototyping is generally not useful for puzzle games. No one sat down and used physical prototyping for Tetris. or Sudoku. All right, but physical prototyping is used, and here is where we get to the intellectual part of it. We use physical prototyping to visualize relationships between game units. In this picture here where this soldier is hiding behind this locker looking thing and these other soldiers are marching by, one of the questions we would consider is which units can see each other? Who sees whom? What is the range of their weapons, assuming they are soldiers? What is the speed of motion of these units? We would begin to consider these things if we got toys out and uh, put them there. Is this unit crawling? In which case, that unit would be much slower than those units, assuming they're human. All right, in this example, we have a light tank coming down a street here, a heavy tank coming down the street here. Someone looking forward from this tank can see, hey, there's a gun barrel coming around the corner. Someone in this tank can't see anything, so when this tank emerges here, it could be very critical to know how fast can that turret turn. If it's instantaneous, it's a very different outcome than if it takes 35 seconds. And this is very important, especially for those of you who are going to do this exercise at home. <laughs> 
Figures can substitute for other things. Physical prototyping is very often done with the little plastic army men because they're cheap and readily available. And so these little plastic army men, these soldiers could represent a military first person shooter, of course. That's what it looks like. But this could also represent a zombie apocalypse. All of those figures could be an army of a horde, perhaps, of zombies that are approaching the player. Or maybe these figures could represent a massively multiplayer online role-playing game in which the toys represent other toys, as in the case of uh, Lego Universe, which I think doesn't exist anymore. But that was a toy MMORPG. Or maybe it's a Western MMORPG where cowboys are fighting robot kangaroos. And perhaps these soldiers represent the cowboys and these represent the robot kangaroos that will be deployed in a software version when your game is produced. Or perhaps it's a single player role playing game. And you can use that soldier to represent a knight or a princess or a dragon or a slug or whatever unit you need. In this case, these figures appear to be a fair fraction of the height of the first story of a house. So they might represent giant robots marching through a city. They might also represent dinosaurs. Perhaps it's a Tyrannosaurus or a Velociraptor coming down the street of your city. Let's talk about what happens when you're using figures on an open table, trying to figure out your game mechanics. One thing is distances between the units must be measured. You may have to get out a measuring stick or a tape measure or figure distances in some other way between the units. You must figure out how the units move. We'll say maneuvering. How the units interact. We'll assume it's firing at each other, although in the case of magic or nonviolent games, firing might not be the word for their interaction. But there's going to be some interaction based on how they're facing to each other and their distance from each other. And so we use things like a firing cone in that example, or a maneuvering arc or ring in that example, that kind of estimate where things could interact. Now it's very easy when you use square grids and you're working in straight perpendicular lines, as in the example of the two tanks in a city. But square grids become a little less convenient um, when you're dealing with diagonals and you have to estimate ranges or calculate ranges. You need that old Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, so there's a squared, there's b squared, and there's c squared to figure out that distance. So in this case in squares, we have 10 squares this way, 7 squares this way, and we square both of those, take the square root of that, and we get this distance is 12.2. Easy for a computer to do on a fly, but if you're doing your physical prototyping, you'll probably not do those in your head. Get out your calculator or Excel spreadsheet. Now, what about facing? Well, what we call facing, the direction that a unit is pointed, it's very easy when they're in a straight line with each other. It's quite obvious what's going on there. But when you get in a situation like this, say this represents a fighter aircraft, this represents a bomber aircraft, the question is can the fighter's guns hit the bomber 
from this position? Well, you have to come up with some rules for that. You'll have to figure out that relationship using something like a firing cone. So straight ahead from that figure's exact distance would go there. To actually hit the target would be like that. You're now looking at the granularity of time in your physical prototype. This, these positions are just one instant in time. You're representing them moving in real time, so that's actually a little bit of curving might be taking place uh, between the instance of time, instances of time. So, and that's why you use things like firing cones. Or, can this fighter, if he can't uh, shoot from where he is, can he turn in time to shoot? You have to have established some sort of rule for the maneuvering, the turning of that fire, fighter, of that unit. If it only ever goes straight, then no, can never interact that way. Well, we can learn a lot from tabletop war games. No matter what interaction you want to have, even if it's magical and totally nonviolent, you can learn a lot from the interaction of units from the rules used in very violent war games that have been uh, developed for decades, if not centuries. Uh, many of the tabletop war games that we have use these things called hex maps. And you've probably seen these before. I see nodding here in the classroom. A lot of people have played games using hex maps. Um, here's one that I played back in the uh, 1970s. Um, Battlestar Galactica by FASA, where we had the old Colonial Vipers. Let's see, two Colonial Vipers there. Six Cylon Raiders there. There's a planet and a moon represented on this hex map here. This planet happens to be a half of a foam ball. The spaceships are cutouts of cardboard, we called them counters. And something like this, where you've got your Cylon Raiders here, your planet with the Vipers emerging around it there, in a physical prototype, can really help you to establish viewpoint, can help you to understand how it looks in the game and what to realistically expect your players to think of the situation. Here's another one. This is uh, Zaya. This is a new one, Legends of a Drift System by Far Off Games. This was a Kickstarter game, came out last year. It's excellent. Um, and in this one, we have 2D positions and movement with 3D plastic figures. And it turns out that even though space is a three-dimensional place, most space games have generally two-dimensional movement. Because unless you're developing Kerbal Space Program, it's very hard for players to think in uh, three dimensions with gravity and orbital, orbital mechanics and things like that. And frankly, even if you are developing Kerbal Space Program, um, it's difficult for humans to think like that. You need some heavy duty computing power to work in three dimensions with realistic gravity, relativity, and Newtonian motion. Okay, so when we're using hex maps for our physical prototyping or playing games, we have these terms we think of. I used this one before, facing. We have counting ranges. Very easy to do on a hex map. We have forward movement. We have, in some games, side slipping. We'll have rules for the changing facing. Movement may be written in turn-based games or vectored, as in real-time uh, games. If you've never played a game like that, I'll describe very quickly vectored movement. Um, vectored movement. Um, Instead of you move, then I move, then you move, then I move, and you move a certain number of hexes, everybody moves one hex at a time. Like in Starfleet Battles, there are 32 impulses, 
on its chart, somebody who's moving very fast will move one hex in all 32 of those. Somebody who's moving very slowly will only move during a couple of those. And that simulates real time in a very nice way in uh, uh, hex regulated movement. Car Wars by Steve Jackson Games did something very similar. They did one square at a time and in five phases instead of 32 impulses. I invite you to check out those games and the magnificent ways they regulated movement for real time. All right, getting back to and winding up our physical prototyping discussion. Physical prototyping does not replace the 3D environment of a 3D game. You're still going to need some sort of software representation of it. But it can tremendously help the early stages of your computer game's development as you start thinking about how it's going to look and describing it to your fellow human beings. These images can be very useful. It can be very useful to show what the pilot's view would look like from this biplane, for example. Physical prototyping also allows you to think through how the various elements of the game are going to interact with each other. With getting information from each other by seeing each other or scanning each other or magically charming each other. How their uh, things like the, the rotation of this turret, things like the is this object penetrable by whatever weapons or sensory apparatus you're using in this game? These are uh, things you will consider in the physical prototyping phase. Physical prototype also helps you describe your ideas to the programming team. Here we have Lego Star Wars with a Bantha and a Jedi and a Jawa sand crawler on Tatooine. Well, this, is, this tank is representing a Jawa sand crawler. This dinosaur is representing the Bantha. And this plastic Indian is representing the Jedi. And you could use a photograph like that to describe to the programming team, this is what it's going to look like. Physical prototyping also allows you to visualize, this is really important, the core gameplay. Core gameplay defined as you know, core gameplay, the, the motion, the positions, the actions that the player repeats the most often. And here's the textbook example of core gameplay from the Halo games. And that is the uh, golden triangle that Halo established of melee and weapons and grenades that you could switch back and forth. Uh, physical prototyping can help you to understand, visualize, communicate with your programming team and with your financial backers the core gameplay of the game you're trying to create. And that's it for this week. We're now going to go to the, our lab, get out some toys, do a physical prototyping exercise. And next week, we're going to talk about functionality, completeness, and balance, and how to evaluate that in the games that we create. And until next week, this is Mike Substelny signing off for Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College.